Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot, where we upgrade our lead generation. Today, we're diving into what marketing vendors and clients need to have in place to have a good relationship. But first, I want to remind you that I'd love to know what you think about what you've heard or what you'd like to hear on a future episode. Please tell me via social media. I'm at Funnel Reboot. You can leave listener feedback at 613-703-7073 or use the form on the FunnelReboot.com site. So to today's show, there's a counterintuitive saying that goes, good fences make good neighbors. Nobody does marketing today completely by themselves. Whether we're in-house or we're on a vendor side, we always have partners or neighbors in the mix. And most of us approach them in a neighborly way. But there's one task in the relationship forming process that makes most of us squirm, contracting. These contracts contain what's important to both sides. And although we like to leave it to the last minute, we really shouldn't spring them on the other party. Their content should be shared early on to help everyone get a feel for what they're getting into. Our guest is a professional speaker and has been in the pay-per-click space for over a decade and has been helping businesses grow online in one shape or form for two decades through her consultancy, Neptune Moon. She's been named a top influencer on lists including PPC Heroes Top 25 list perennially. She made the list again this year in 2021. She's also the managing director of PPC Chat, where paid search professionals gather weekly on Twitter to talk shop. She's known for her practical rubber meets the road outlook. So who better to talk to about contracts? Listen to her as she says the contracts lay the foundation for good vendor client relationships. And she argues that we shouldn't shy away from talking about them. So we go through a lot of details on what should be in contract agreements. Stick around and hear how they can be a win-win with Julie Baccini. Julie Baccini, welcome to Funnel Reboot. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, Julie. So you and I know each other. We've you know met each other uh, multiple times and uh, we're also in the same vicinity as being vendors of marketing services, right? Yes. Uh, what we what we have in common is we've both run through, I think, the gamut of different uh, services and the relationships that you can have with clients. And we've both seen the need for there having to be good contracts in place. A hundred percent. I like to joke that I've worked, you know, when, if you have a setup, I've probably worked in that setup, you know, anything that you can imagine what it looked like between the vendor and the client, um, or working, you know, even as a subcontract, I mean, I've worked in practically any scenario you can think about, and I am a firm believer in contracts in every single situation. Yeah. They're, uh, you know, I mean, never that enthralling to go at them. Everybody, especially at the beginning, just is chomping at the bit to get into the marketing. But, you know, maybe tell me just what your approach is at the beginning of a relationship so that, you know, maybe we can get people who aren't quite believing that contracts have to be in place or who aren't looking forward to this exercise. Uh, How do you like to onboard it? Yeah, I I am a huge believer that a contract is so important in any type of business relationship. And the most important aspect of it, what it really, really boils down to is you want to have a shared, agreed upon um, scope of work, terms, cost. You want to have all this stuff predefined and you want to do it right at the, right at the beginning so that... Everybody knows what, what you're doing, you know, what the scope is, what you're doing, how much you're charging for it, and then what your different policies are and your terms are. And we can, we can get into some more specifics. I know sure. I, if anybody follows me on Twitter, I, whenever anything comes up regarding a contract, I am always the first person to be like, put that in your contract, make sure that's spelled out in your contract, because I feel it's so important 
for no matter which side of the equation you're on to make sure that as many things that can be fully defined are defined. Mm. So you have something to come back to if there's a question about, you know, how long should this take? What should we be paying for this? Is this included in what we're doing? We've come to you and made this, this XYZ request. Is that something that's within the scope of the agreement? If you have done your work in the beginning and you have set up a contract that clearly lays out what's included in the project. And frankly, I always have a big list of exclusions of what is not specifically not included in the project. Yeah. Then you have something that you can mutually go back to and, and, you know, kind of cross check, like, Hey, is this included? You know, is this not clearly not included? Are we in a bit of a gray area? Like what do, what do we want to do? The contract gives you that um, unbiased basis, you know, that you can, re you can return to. So it's a factual document. It's not somebody's opinion. You've, you've agreed, you know, to what was in the, in the contract. Sure. And I think that that's uh, like, there are some people who might have the misconception that, you know, you got some hotshot lawyer and you figured out a way with your contract to stack it all in your favor. Uh, you know, there are people who think that way, right? That, you know, they're like, ah, I can get you here and get you there and zing you with this fine print. Um, a mutual friend of ours, uh, PPC Kirk, uh, Kirk Williams, he said that the contracts define and preserve the intent of the relationship. So I think that that's a Love huge, that. right? that's a huge, mm -hmm. you know, signal that, okay, we don't have to worry about this, you know, making it advantageous to your side. If you have good intent about getting into a relationship with another party, there's all you need to know. And, and, by virtue of that, it's still important to write that down. So I think it's important. We're, we're not saying if your intent is good, even on both sides, it doesn't mean that a handshake and a nod is fine. No, because if your intent is good, it, it's kind of even more reason to write it down, isn't it? Because you want to remember that in a time when there's the, the slogging is tough or there's a, like you said, a gray area. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think one of the most important things that, that can be defined in a contract is what happens if one of the parties wants to exit the contract, right? Because if you have not put anything in place that defines, you know, how does one exit this on either side, right? How does either side exit this contract? It can get really messy really fast. Yep. <laughs> so I think you know, that that's one of the basic areas that you want to make sure that you that you have covered. And then everybody understands this is what this is what the, the terms are. So is it, you know, you give two weeks notice, you have to give 30 days written notice, like what what are those terms in there? And then again, everyone understands, okay, if we're having some type of problem, and either the vendor or the uh, client wants to terminate the contract, there's very clear language in there into what that what that process is and what what compensation would be expected, you know, to still be be provided? Like, where does that cut off and, and all of that? The more things like that you can define from the beginning, the cleaner anything you have to deal with as you're working on a project, you know, going going forward. I, I just, I, I've experienced it so many times. I sort of joke when, when I talk about contracts of like, oh yeah, I have a clause in my contract for that. Oh yeah, I have a clause in my contract. You know, and people are like, wow, you have so much stuff in your contract. And I think to myself, well, I've been doing this for 21 21 right. years now, right? Like right. a lot of stuff has happened. <laughs> yeah. And each time you've gone back in, I mean, that's how they evolve, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I heard somewhere someone joke that it's scar tissue, <laughs> right? I, yeah. You know, that's not a bad way to, to describe it. And not everything that ends up getting incorporated into like your next version of the contract is necessarily because of something negative Correct. that happened. It could be that you might just realize, like maybe you see a Twitter thread and you see someone talking about something that they're going through and it never occurred to you to have a clause in your contract about, like one of the ones I've talked about recently is defining your turnaround time yep. for messages, but also defining your time zone and your working hours within that time zone. Ooh. So maybe Good that's one. something that you've never thought about, right? Maybe yeah. you only ever work with people who are in your same time zone. And if that's the case, you must be thrilled because working with people outside your time zone can be tricky. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's sort of one thing. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing that happens, but sometimes you have an experience and you just kind of have that light bulb moment and you think like, you know, 
This would be really good for me to define a bit more clearly so that, again, you're, you're laying out those clear expectations yep. right from the beginning. Hey, these are the, I work between these hours. And for me, those hours are Eastern Standard Time. Right. <laughs> Even if you are in the Pacific Standard Time Zone, the, the, these are my regular, you know, regular working hours, as an example. Would you agree that when you're updating the contract like that, that it sometimes... And I'm speaking more from, you know, the, the vendor side, it gets light bulbs going off with maybe different services. Or if you say, well, um, I could offer that, you know, wider range of hours, but most of my clients don't care about it. But if I did have either some kind of a rush thing or a off hours kind of availability, maybe that's a service that a few of my clients would be willing to pay more for. Yes. So I started before I did PPC, I used to do websites. And prior to that, I was a print graphic designer because I've been in marketing since before the internet. (laughs) So one of the things that, (laughs) one of the things that I kind of brought forward with me in the way that I think about PPC and contracts and, and projects and scopes is a little bit of a legacy from the website days when I was doing website projects. And one of the things that I developed for myself and I put in my agreements was the concept of a customary versus a rush production schedule. Yep. So, you know, basically the concept being everything that you do should be within the customary production schedule or customary turnarounds, right? And then you, if something is going to bump from the customary level into this rush or emergency level, that has to be mutually agreed upon by both parties that, yes, we agree (laughs) that what it is that's being requested and the turnaround time that's being requested kicks it from the customary into the rush slash emergency. And then the rush slash emergency has additional fees involved because the project was quoted Assuming that I would be able to manage my work time, let's say, you know, I plan out my week. Okay, these are all the things that I need to do. I needed to take care of this stuff on Monday, this Tuesday, et cetera. Um, you know, and we're not talking about things that are outside of anybody's control. So if, if something happens and the website goes down and it's an emergency, obviously we're in agreement that it's in the best interest of both the vendor and our clients that certain things are just, you automatically drop everything and take care of it. And then right. You just do that. Right. But I'm talking about the things that sort of are outside of that pretty narrow band of things that are truly, truly, you know, you need to drop everything and take care of this right now. Sometimes there will be requests that are um, positioned that way that aren't right. truly in that, you know, this is really, this is really a huge problem that needs to be addressed. And so I think having, having it clearly defined again for both sides so that If a request is made and it's not in that narrow band of true emergencies, then if you've already established it, then, you know, as the vendor, you come back to the client and say, okay, I understand this is what you're wanting. And and this is the turnaround that you're seeking. This is what that means, you know, as far as our our agreement. And I can move some stuff around and I can make this happen for you, but there will be an additional charge for that. And this is what that would be. Do you want to proceed or do you want to keep this? Do you want me to address this in the customary time, you know, the customary time frame? And so it gives it gives space for those types of conversations to happen. And it gives a framework to be able to talk about them where you're not feeling emotional or feeling like taking on your, you know, someone else's stress <laughs> over, you know, what needs to be happening. You're coming back to a rational, you know, mutually agreed upon set of um you know, terms. And then you're figuring out like, okay, where does this really fall? Cause we have to agree on this. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that the, the timing of when you can do it. And like you said, the, let's call it emotionless, um, you know, sit back, let's, let's look through things together. This could be done at any point in the sales process, but it's better to do it earlier. Um, I think in a lot of cases, the whole, you know, amping up of a pitch and, you know, winning the business that can cloud some people's judgment. And I speak again for both sides here. It's important that you have these conversations. The, you know, you've heard it said, there's no such thing as a good vendor and a bad vendor and a good client and a bad client. There's just a good 
vendor client fit or a bad vendor client fit. Right. So if the, if the client likes to run at 90 miles an hour all the time, and that doesn't fit with the vendor's customary times of delivering things, we should get that out of the way early so that, right. And you can do it just by running through a contract. You don't have to, you know, kind of say, whoa, you know, I'm, I'm before we get all into, you know, buying our services and, you know, you can just say, Hey, we've got a couple of things that we like to review with everybody at this point in the game. Do you mind if I take a few minutes and just run you through them? Yeah, I think it's definitely whatever you feel are the most important terms or clauses or sections within your contract, the ones that either um, you have had to refer back to most frequently or the ones that you know, like this is this one's really, really important to me, uh, you know, again, on on either side of the equation. So it could be, you know, for a vendor, it could be the, you know, the working hours, the turnaround times, it could be those kind of things. If you're on the client side, it could be, you know, do we own our account? Are we, you know, are we the owners of things? Like where, where is that ownership defined? You know, where, is there anything that should this relationship be terminated, you are going to like wholly pick up and take with you as a vendor? Like a, a client should understand what, what that is. Yep. Um, personally, I don't think that should be anything, but I mean, that's a, you know, right. but whatever, however you want to define things, I think that it's, it's imperative for the person who is writing the contract to make sure that all of the aspects that they feel are critical are not only included in the contract, but that you go over it. Conversely, whichever side is on the receiving end of the contract, it's incredibly important that you read the whole thing. Yep. <laughs> so I think a lot of times what can happen, especially if you've, if you've really hit it off, you know, between client and vendor, and you're really excited on both sides about the potential for this relationship and about what what it is you might do together, right? I mean, those are the greatest those are the greatest relationships that that start. Everybody's super excited, and it's almost like sometimes the paperwork can be a little bit of an afterthought because you've already you're just juiced up about wanting to get started on the first several things that that really made you connect in the first place, and that's wonderful. But I think you need to have a little bit of like a cooler business head. Yep. prevail, even if it's only for an hour, <laughs> to make sure that all those ducks are are in a row. Yeah. Because first of all, you'll never have as much goodwill. <laughs> you know, that it's like the honeymoon period, right? Even exactly. if you're doing a great job for a client, it's so much easier to just go over all that stuff right in the beginning and make sure that you're on the same page. I mean, I think your example about a client that likes to go, you know, a hundred miles an hour all the time. And, you know, we we're flying by the seat of our pants and this is how we do things and whatever. That's not a great fit for everybody. Like for me, if I heard somebody talking that way in the prospecting process, yep. I don't know that I would take it to the proposal process. And that, that's just, that's just my personal preference as far as I have worked with <laughs> folks who are, who, who operate that way. And I'm, thrilled if that works for them. You know, that's, that's great. Nobody has to be exactly like me. I'm certainly not saying that, but I know enough about myself and I know enough about the ways that, that I work, that I thrive, that I'm not stressed out about work outside of my work time. Yep. That when I hear certain things, when you're having those initial conversations about what does this look like, or how did it work with your previous vendor? Or, you know, you're, you're kind of having a little bit of that get to know you time I think it's also okay, even before you get to a point where you have a contract, if there are things that are coming up on either side that make you feel like, ooh, that's going to be a little bit of pause. I think you should listen to that. And maybe it's something that through conversation, you could find out that, oh, it really isn't that big of a deal. We're kind of, we are kind of on the same page or whatever, but you may find that you're just coming from spaces where you're, you're going to have difficulty being really compatible. Mm -hmm. And that's not fun. That's no matter which side of the equation you're on. That's, that's not fun when you find yourself in a space where you're really not meshing well. Yeah. There shouldn't be any surprises. That's the other good side. If you're clear on what your terms are and they make their way into the conversation wherever appropriate, then by the time everybody has signed and you're into engagement, it's, you know, we shouldn't have any of that, uh, that it's really bad if we do, um, 
Julie, what's your take on the time period that a contract could have? And, you know, some of them are even open, but, you know, how do you like to think of uh, the amount of time that should be put on a contract and what should be set at the end of that contract for the next phase? So ideally, I mean, as a vendor, we would all love to have at least a year long contract with all of our clients, right? I mean, that, that's from the vendor side, you're like, this is what we want. We want to know because a lot of what we do in PPC, it takes a little time yep. to get to get going, right? And so I think you can, you can set your, and I'll call it your initial term. Okay. You can set that to be whatever you want. I know, you know, we, we've had a lot of discussions about this tell about pricing and contracts and how you set things up. It's been an ongoing discussion for years in the PPC chat community and people have a lot of different opinions and they offer a lot of different, really interesting, interesting viewpoints. So I can say, you know, I have seen people advocating for all kinds of different ways to do it. Myself personally, I like to have a, a minimum commitment period because, like I said, it takes a certain amount of time to really do do the discovery that you need to do and dig in. Yep. And then you need time to operate a little bit. <laughs> so you've done your deep, you know, you've done your deeper discovery. You're you're really getting to to know each other, client and vendor, as far as what everybody's bringing to the table, what what some maybe priorities are that you've uncovered. In that discovery process that maybe, you know, maybe the first priority is now really like the second or third priority, because through that process, you have figured out together that what previously was number two is actually number one. So yeah. I think yeah. I don't like to be in a position where I have to shortchange that that initial process. So I like to have, I would say the absolute minimum that I would do for the initial contract would be three months. And then I typically have my contracts. Um, we would just renew them month, month to month. Or if the client was interested of like, look, I don't want to monkey around with this every single month. <laughs> we want to sign on for another three months. We want to sign on for another six months, whatever. Um, some of it has to do with the vendor and the client's comfort level. And I'll be honest, sometimes it really has to do with their immediate past experience. So a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's particularly the negative variety. So completely. So if, if, a, if a client, let's say, is coming off of an experience that they just had with a vendor and it was negative, and it could be negative for any number, any number of reasons, but if they're coming off a negative experience and part of what contributed to that negative experience was the fact that maybe the client was unhappy, tried to work things out with the vendor and didn't really get where they wanted to be. So they want to terminate the contract. Well, maybe what it took to terminate the, maybe they couldn't terminate the contract. Yeah. Maybe they had to stay on for another six months with right. somebody that really, they were very, very unhappy with. And so I think it's, it's also important to understand the total past experience, but the immediate past experience of what everybody who's going to be involved in the deal brings, brings to the table so that if people have concerns, they can be legitimately addressed. I mean, if you found yourself in that situation, I mean, I'm a vendor, but as a client, if I found my, you know, I buy services <laughs> from other businesses. If I found myself in a space where I was unhappy, I tried to have the vendor rectify the situation. We were not able to come to a satisfactory resolution. And yet I was stuck with them, you know, for another three, four, six, eight months, I would be unhappy. Sure. And I'd be definitely, it would be at the top of my list when I was talking to, finally able to talk with a new vendor for that service. Hey, you're not going to lock me into this, are you? Right. Right. A lot of this is common sense. If we just think about what it might be like, then, you know, if we can establish that up front, or I think a contract can also be a place where the rationale for why that contract needs to be the length it is. There's ways to actually embed that in the in the terms as well. I I, I firmly believe that. Um, if I take, for example, one like intellectual property, and I know we're kind of delving into things where you know I'll just disclaimer this: neither Julie nor I are <laughs> lawyers, but yes. you know when it comes to things like okay, both sides are working on something, but in some cases it can get a little unclear about 
who has the football, right? And and this new thing that has been created, maybe it hasn't yet been completely implemented in an account, whatever it is. Um, you know, do, do you feel that those are things that ought to, we ought to cover? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I it would err on the side of being more specific over less specific all day, every day. I yep. think the more things that you can clearly put I like to think of a contract almost as like a menu, right? And you have one column where these are all the things that are included. It's like column A and column B, right? And column A, this is everything that is going to be included. And this is how it functions. And this is, these are what the rules are, right? Because terms are really rules about how different aspects of the project are going to function, you know, like I, for example, I like to define who is my contact point? Like who as the vendor and as the client, you should want to define this too, frankly, who has the authority (laughs) to approve, not approve, uh, you know, who, if you're going to change the scope of the contract, let's say, like, let's say you're working together and you start out and you're working just on Google ads, right. And things are going swimmingly and everybody's happy. It's like, oh, we want to expand over into Microsoft. Awesome. Everybody's excited to do that. You need to update your contract. You don't have to do a totally new contract. I handle that with a a change of scope document. So it's a really short document that essentially says everything else in the contract is staying the same. Right. (laughs) However, we are amending the scope of work as follows. We are adding, and then you would clearly delineate what it specifically, what it is you're adding. And then you're going to clearly define what is the additional cost. And what the billing cycle, what the billing cycle is. So basically it's a real short document. It doesn't, it's not, you're not producing a whole other contract. You're referring to the original document number and the, and the date of the contract. And then you're just saying like, here's what's different. And this is acting as an addenda to the original, yeah, original you think contract. Of it like stapling an extra page onto the back of the menu. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it doesn't have to be overly complicated. I think sometimes when people think about contracts, they get really nervous because they think like, well, I'm not a lawyer. Like what if, you know, what if I'm signing something and I don't know what it means. And um, so I think creating an environment where people feel empowered to ask questions about the contract, you know, do you have any questions? So going over terms that, that are really important that you want to make sure that they're aware of. And then just as simply as saying, Hey, do you have any questions or concerns about anything that's that's contained within the contract? And I would say, in my experience, 85% of people are like, no, it's fine. <laughs> but I have had people come back and ask me questions like, yeah, you know what? I do have a question about this section or what exactly does this mean? And sometimes we'll end up adding another sentence just so everyone feels comfortable that we're super clearly defining what the turnaround times are, what, you know, it it could be any part of it. Um, But you can, you can always add another sentence if the client is feeling a little unclear the way it's written and you can say, Oh, we can just put, we can just put that in there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And the fact that it's a boilerplate though, you know, like you said, you haven't spent, you know, days and days acting like a lawyer, but you've got it there and it's a, uh, a possible point of discussion. I really love the point you made about how they may come back and say, yeah, actually there is, there's always going to be something I'll call it behind the glass that, you know, a vendor can't see, or maybe on the client side, the client might think, yeah, if I send them a request at five o'clock on a Friday, it'll be ready first thing on the Monday. Right. Because I count, you know, my days this way. And, you know, I don't know what they're doing on the other side. So it's great to raise it. Uh, and, and that can be the modification that comes about because of it, right? Yes. Always use business days right. when you are talking about days. That's just my little contract tip when you're talking about turnaround times or anything else. Including always, the jurisdiction always, that you're, yes. that you're always defining, right? Days. Yes. For, for when business days happen, because different places have different holidays. Yeah. I was just going to say that. So holidays, right? Like dealing, you know, dealing with, with people who are in the United States, Canada, Europe, like all over the world, we have some shared holidays, which we're yep. all like, oh yes, we are all not working on this day. 
But there are different holidays where folks in different countries, you know, we might be working here in the States, but you're not in Canada or, you know, yep. what have you. Yep. So again, just it's, it's, it's a tiny little sentence where you're talking about, you know, turnaround times are generally, I like to say within two business days, mm -hmm. unless, you know, there are, you know, and business days do not include. Right federally recognized holidays in the United States. There you go. <laughs> so that so that's, kind of, it's like, it's okay, there it is, right? Not, not likely to change. Says. Yeah. Yeah, for right. sure. And um, just like you said about rules, I mean, the, the, you run into funny things like we work in marketing. Marketing is kind of notoriously federated, right? You have uh, a company will deal with you. Let's say that you're running their Google ads, but let's say for display ads, you're not the one making the ads. So they have a creative freelancer or another agency. So this whole thing about approvals quickly can get into, oh, well, the third party said I could run them. I thought you'd already seen them first. Right. And so that point of contact, you can, and you could lay that out again, like a rule, you know, it's normally going to be this, but if there's an agency in the picture, here's how it's different. Yeah. And again, these things don't have to be, you know, you don't have to go and have some document notarized and, you know, copied and triplicate. This is as simple as you, you can, and you can say in your contract, you know, email approvals are acceptable. So yeah. you will, you will send an email, you know, if, if you get the, if the, let the, let's use your example, let's say the, the creative agency is working on the, the display ads for whatever network you're working on and you are, the relationship you have between the client, yourself, the vendor, and the, that other agency that they're working with, you've been connected with the creative folks directly. Yep. So, you know, they might say, Hey, Julie, we have all the stuff, you know, we put it in a, we put it in a, a Google drive folder. It's all ready to go. And you're thinking like, Oh, that's amazing. Then you need to make sure <laughs> that this is my process because again, I have had quite a few of what I like to call the lessons that stick. <laughs> and <laughs> the lessons that stick yeah. in my experience are the ones where something goes wrong. And at the end of it, you're like, oh my God, like I never want that to happen again. Like that was a mess. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of stuff that ends up in my contract is a result of a lesson that stuck somewhere yeah. in the last 20 years. But again, yeah. it could be in that situation, it could be just as simple as me, the vendor saying like, okay, I just got all this stuff from from the creative folks. And they may even say in their note, hey, you know, Suzanne approved all this stuff. I am still going to email Suzanne <laughs> myself right. at the client and say, hey, Suzanne, I just, you know, the creative looks amazing. I just got all of this stuff from, you know, Bill who, who made it. Um, you know, he's saying that everything's uh, you know, approved. I want to confirm yeah. that with you. Yeah. And when, you know, that, and then also, I also like to confirm when did you want to start running, you know, these, these pieces. So again, it, it doesn't hurt to over communicate sure. when you're in that situation. Cause it's really easy. And again, this is a lesson for me that stuck at one point. It's very easy to have someone who is not your primary contact person give you direction and you think it's coming it, straight from the right. big boss. Yeah. Whether the person who is doing that has said that or not, they certainly, and it's, I think this is especially true on the, on the vendor side, if you're, le you know, if you're less experienced. And so hopefully some of these things we're talking about today can help people who maybe who haven't been doing this as long on either side of this equation to, you know, feel like it's okay to take a breath. <laughs> And it's okay to want to just kind of maybe run through a checklist in your head or even a thought process of like, hmm, is this going to, is my butt going to be covered yep. <laughs> if somebody comes back and is like, why did you do this? So you're, I think one of the great things that contracts do is they can empower people on both sides to, you're looking at a shared set of criteria. So you've agreed upon what that is. And so that can give you your little thought process when communication is flowing back and forth. Yes. Where you can stop and be like, okay, this is what I know based on the contract, like this is what the process is supposed to be. This person is the one who blesses everything. I don't see them in this loop. You know, I need to know for my own protection, I am going to 
loop that person in, send them a quick note. Hey, I got all this stuff, you know, but I need for you to, you know, to be the person who signs off on it. Yeah. And this isn't in an adversarial way. I mean, if we look at places in elsewhere in life where this kind of thing is done, and the first one that comes to me is NASA. And when you see that mission control room and you see the person kind of sitting kind of like where a quarterback does with a team, you know, they're at the back, but they're right in the center and they can see everything, but they will wait while we're doing the, are you good? Are you good? Are you good? And the lowliest person, you know, at any point can kind of speak up and say, well, on my checklist, I've got an item that isn't complete here. And, you know, everybody just respects the process because, and I think this is one of the things that I didn't really catch in the early part of my career is I thought that if you were speaking up at that moment, you'd get in trouble. Right. But that's not the case. Everybody at the top, actually, like you said, their sphere of what they see, they're moving, you know, there's, they're in charge of a lot of things. And if you don't, if you aren't seeing their name on the distribution or you haven't raised it with them, it's actually better for you to do it at that point. And what better way than to say the rule according to the terms and conditions is that we check. And and now you're just doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? It removes the vagueness. It does. And I think that's one of the great things that, that contracts do in general. It, it takes the personal level out of things. And I mean, I do also want to say I, I'm a huge believer in contracts. I have had... Um, occasion to actually have a legal dispute where I was really glad that I had a contract. Um, I hope for everyone else's sake, (laughs) you never find yourself in that spot because it's awful. Yeah. But, um, you know, certainly that motivates me to want to make sure that everything is very clearly defined. But I also think sometimes people can have a little bit of a perception around contracts and the need for contracts that somehow by insisting on uh, a contractual document that you're somehow putting forward um, the idea that you're not on the up and up or you're not trustworthy or you're not going, or, or you think that about the other part, about the other party. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think sometimes there can be a little bit of a negative vibe around the whole idea of having, of having contracts, but I, of course, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think we're looking at wanting to have the strongest foundation on which to develop this new, this new relationship. So that everybody feels like, like, we all know where the other person's coming from. We all know what the expectations are on both sides. I like to define in my contracts, like, what are the client's responsibilities? In all of this, right? Because you think about like, whoever's writing the contract, you think about it's largely what am I going to do for you? Right? Like I'm a vendor. What am I a client? What am I doing for you? And I'm going to define all of this stuff. And that's really important, but I have a whole section in mind, which like, and this is what you're going to do. You know, these are my expectations as far as, you know, responsibilities that you're, you're agreeing to. And before anybody thinks that they're anything crazy, there are things such as, um, you know, I have to have access to all of the accounts, right? You know, I need to have a single point of contact who has the ability to, you know, approve things. Like it's, it's nothing wildly legal ease that's going on in there. It's like, Hey, when I send you stuff that needs your feedback, I I need you to provide feedback, right? (laughs) You know, so it's, it, a contract is not all scary legal language. I mean, I think there's some things that you want to make sure you have the proper legal language in to cover yeah. yourself. You know, again, both sides want to be reasonably covered against a bad actor. Like there are bad actors that end up in contracts. You know, if you find yourself in an agreement with someone who is not legit on the up and up or whatever, hopefully your contract will at least, you know, somewhat protect you. But I think coming from a, a way of thinking that contracts are not automatically sort of like setting up an adversarial relationship that they're really designed to create that strong agreed upon foundation can kind of change the way you think and feel about them in general. I've seen in general and on that client responsibilities, I've been surprised to see, let's say a CMO who is getting the contract and they actually aren't picking it over 
because of what the vendor is, but they're looking at it and they've asked me questions like, so my junior person had better do this for you. That's what I have to like. They want to know what, what are they holding their own side accountable for? Yeah. And I think in a relationship, you know, when, when you are hiring an outside consultant or agency to work on some scope of something for you, I think both sides want to know, <laughs> this is exactly what I'm doing. Hey, this is who is going to be involved on our side. We're going to have these three people are going to be involved. This is who you're going to interface with. But this is the person who has the, you know, the final say, the decision-making authority. Yep. Um, you know, so and it, like I said, the more, the more that you can define without getting to the point where you're sending somebody a 20 page document. I mean, nobody wants to get a 20 page document. No. <laughs> so within reason, but I think that making sure that you're covering the most important bases is something well, you really want to think about. Yeah. And on that, no conversation can be complete without the payment topic. Right. So let's, let's kind of hit it home with that one. Um, what, advice do you have for people on, and I'm particularly thinking of vendors here because that is probably the biggest thing that uh, they would like to know that their contract is doing well. Um, any general tips on the payment and invoicing part of the contract? Yeah. So again, you want to be as clear as possible. If you have different types, if, if you bill things differently, let's say, you want to make sure that you're defining that in your in your payment section. So let's say, you know, you might set your, your, some people build different ways in, in PPC. Again, yep. we've had many a discussion about this, but like, yep. let's say, for example, you are setting your project up so that there's an initial like discovery build rebuild piece, and that's going to cost X dollars. Then you want to define, this is what this costs. This is what's involved. This is when you will be billed. So am I handing you that invoice with the contract document? Am I, as the vendor, sending that to you 15 days later, 30 days later? Like, when should the vendor expect to send the invoice and when should the client expect to receive it? And then I think it's equally important as a vendor, you should have your own terms as far as when do you expect people to pay it? Is it due upon receipt? Is it, you know, due in fit like net 15, meaning due 15, you know, within 15 days of receipt? Is it net 30? What what are your terms? You need to figure that out. But you also need to make sure that you and the client are on the same page. Because lots of clients, depending on the size yep. of the, the client, some of them are like, oh yeah, whatever your terms are, that's fine, right? Other clients <laughs> might be like, this is how we pay. <laughs> and you, you want to know that, right? Yeah. So you want to make sure that your, your terms as a vendor are not immediately in conflict. Right. With how, so if the, if the client pays, they say, look, you know, we don't pay any faster than net 30. And maybe your terms as a vendor are typically due upon receipt. Right. Maybe you want to alter your language in, in that particular contract so that you're not setting yourself up to be you know, with the client being a quote unquote late payer because your terms are saying it's due right away, but they're telling you right up front, Hey, we pay net 30. Yep. Or when they say we, it can be a conversation of, you know, uh, you have to remember, and I'm again, looking from the vendor side, a client, you know, it's organizations are complicated places. So they may, when they use that Royal, we, they may actually be aware of the fact that, they wish they could go faster and maybe there's a way they can go faster, but there's a person over in finance who's the judge of that. And there needs to be certain boxes checked before, you know, it, that person over in finance will make a change. So maybe if you go through at that point, all right, well, the reason we do it is this way. And this is the, you know, we, I have some room to accommodate, but I actually have a firm edge here have that discussion. You don't know where it will lead. And as they say, if you don't ask, you don't get. I think that's a hundred percent true. So to use this example, we were just talking about if your typical terms are due upon receipt and the client says, Hey, you know, we, we really do net 30. You have a few different options there. You could come back to them and say, okay, well, um, you know, could we potentially do net 15? 
And they might say, I don't know, let me go back and ask the, let me ask the, the finance and accounting folks. We might be able to set you up at, at net 15. Um, so you, you have options. The other option you have as a vendor that I would like to point out is, let's say you're typically used to do upon receipt. The client says, I really wish I had flexibility on this, but you're like, we are net 30. Like there is no, there is no moving this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is an immovable object. You will get paid 30 days after your invoices is submitted. You then have a choice as a vendor to consider changing when you present your invoices. So right. let's say you are a, typically a due upon receipt person. And for ongoing work, your typical practice is to produce an invoice, you know, within the first couple of days of the month for the previous month's work. You may decide for a client who is net 30, you are going to still produce a bill in the first, you know, one to two business days of the month, but it is for the month in front of you. Yep. So that's a way for you to be able to continue to have your cash flow the way that you want to have it. And you're working with the client and you're not, <clears throat> excuse me, making it a big difficult deal of like, well, I only do do upon receipt. It's like, well, you know, there are multiple ways for, for both sides to be able to work within the parameters that are available. So if it's free and open and it's kind of like, I don't know, what do you want? Well, here's what I want. Okay, we can do that. That's wonderful. But it doesn't always, it, it just, you run into immovable objects when it comes to the people who cut the checks more often than not when you're dealing with clients of a certain size. Um, and that's fine. And I think you don't ever want to make a client feel bad, you know, as a vendor about what the, what the company's policy is. Like they don't, you know, the person you're dealing with doesn't have any control over it yep. 99 times out of a hundred. So it's yep. like, all right, well, how do we make this work? So we both feel, feel good about this. So I don't feel like I'm sitting here doing a whole bunch of work and it's taking 45 days and now it's stretching into 60 days when I'm getting paid. Um, so, you know, just being people and just talking with each other, but being flexible enough as a vendor in your own thinking of like, all right, I don't usually do the terms this way, but I think I can still get what I want, but be within the parameters that works okay, you know, for the client. So a little creative thinking when it comes to terms like that can also be helpful. Back to what we said at the beginning, this is a relationship. And so I don't know any relationship where those parameters, you know, they're about different things like who's picking up the kids from school or, you know, who's going to um, book the restaurant for Friday night or whatever you're talking. There's expectations and we have a discussion about them and we all get kind of clear on them. And the contract is kind of the place that it just sits and it can Possibly never be, you know, looked at once everybody is good to go and, and off on the way. But uh, I think to kind of finish here, the, the point being is, yeah, we all think about the price and we all think about the scope. But I think what you've helped us do today is to expand it to say, well, also think about those parts that would need to, as you say, provide the foundation for delivering that scope and getting the price that you are charging back, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, you're, it, it's always people dealing with people. And so to the extent that you make it a, a conversation where you're positioning it, that you're really sitting on the same side of the table, yep. even though you might be vendor and client. If again, this is just my philosophy, but if, if you're going to be entering into a working relationship, like my assumption already is that we, we are embarking upon something where we are having shared goals. So, you know, I, I want my clients to be as happy as they can possibly be. And I want to achieve and deliver all the things that we've talked about. And I, you know, so I don't view a contract as something where we're sitting, you know, we're lawyers on opposite sides of the table and we're trying to hammer this out and it's very adversarial. And it's one, one, yeah, uh, winner takes all. Yeah. Right. I view that we're sitting on the same side of the table and we're looking at this document together and we are saying, we want to start working together. And these are the things that we want to be doing. And this is how we want to do it. And these are some, you know, guardrails for certain things that can get a little sticky, you know, when it comes to like how fast is turnaround, you know, when should you expect to hear from me? Can, here's another one. Can I just send you the dreaded, you know, can we just jump on a call email? <laughs> you know, what, 
how do you handle that? Um, you know, what's a standard amount of communication? I think, you know, in our business, we've all had clients who, um, really, really, really want to be in touch a ton. Yeah. Um, you know, so just defining all those things, but it, think of it as you're, you're sitting together doing that. You're making notes together. You're, you're defining, Hey, this is what this would look like. Does that say, you know, is that, does that work for you? And, and coming to that agreement. And then at the end of it, you've got your contract and you've both agreed to it in a, in a friendly, you know, collaborative sense, as opposed to, you know, two adversaries across the table, trying to make sure that like, well, if anyone's going to get screwed, it's not going to be me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like who wants, well, who wants that? Nobody wants that. No. And that doesn't bode well for the relationship. Mm -mm. So, uh, better, better to have a, a expectation of a good relationship and then have a contract. Like we said that kind of, it doesn't matter, um, which side would be presenting it and which side gets it. It, you know, if, if we've all kind of agreed on it, then it's our joint contract. And like you said, it is there to help us achieve a shared goal. hundred percent. Yeah. Julie, if people want to reach out to you, if they want to find out more about what you do and Neptune Moon, which is the PPC company that you founded, how can they do that? You can find me a number of different places. If you are interested in my services, Neptune Moon, you can find me at www.neptunemoon.com. I am also the managing director of PPC Chat over on Twitter, which is a huge, welcoming, inclusive community for PPC practitioners of all skill levels. So you can find, I'm very active on Twitter. You can find me over on Twitter at Neptune Moon. And we do weekly chats. So you can find us very active on Tuesdays at noon Eastern. And we do an audio version on Thursdays at noon Eastern. And we'll have links to that in the show notes. Julie, I want to thank you very much. And to the listener, I hope that you've gotten some really good value out of what Julie shared. And if you like it, or if you know somebody that could benefit from it, somebody who's maybe embarking on their next client engagement or vendor engagement, please share this episode with them. And I hope that you found a way with what we've said today to make some part of your funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.